Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. I'm here with Ron Yates. We're at his Spicewood Vineyards location here, and uh, he's been kind enough to allow me to come out here, hang out with them. We did some little vineyard stuff. I'm probably going to come back and do some more vineyard shots because it's pretty crappy weather still, but the shot I wanted, I got for the intro, and I think that's going to be the intro shot, but it'll be the next time I come mm -hmm. out here because it's going to be epic. Um, so, yeah, we're down here in the barrel room, and um, mainly because, well, they actually had a customer come in. <laughs> so it makes more sense for us to be in an area where the customers won't be in the background or we hear them. So, Ron, kind of introduce yourself, and yeah. you know, how did you decide to do all this? What, what made you get uh, be crazy like that? I always tell everybody I went to law school and had to find something else to do after law school. No, uh, I, I had the really good fortune of having to go to Spain in 1999 to get my Spanish credit so I could graduate from the University of Texas. And uh, while while there, uh, yeah. while there, uh, we fell in love with Tempranillo. We, the Spanish beer was so bad. Sorry, Spain. It was. Spanish beer was so bad and they served it like, you know, room temperature. And after we had spent a week or two in Germany and France, we're in some of the best beer in the world. And we got there and it was just like, I can't, I can't drink this. And the, the, the family we live with, the lady, you know, she was in her seventies and she didn't get home from, from being out till 1 AM. And it was like, it was normal. They didn't eat dinner till 11. And it was just like, I can't drink crappy beer all night long. So we got introduced to Tempranillo and for, you know, a, about the same price as a, one of those liters of water, you could get a, a bottle of Tempranillo and it's like, it blew my mind. It was so great. And it was, uh, we would sit out in the park and a couple of us would have a glass or two or three of Tempranillo and then you were straight. You could drink beer the rest, you could drink their bad beer the rest of the night. Uh, but we just really <laughs> fell in love with it. And we stayed in Spain that summer and I went back a couple summers and we just traveled around and, and some of the the family I lived with, one of their sons was a grape grower and and that region, uh, kind of the, the, the Toro and Ribera del Duero, kind of, you know, not quite as hilly up as, as it was in Rioja, but that region to me just seemed exactly like, like Texas, granite clay, limestone soil, it's hot, the river runs through it. And I was like, this looks like home. This looks like the hill country. You know, they're a little higher in elevation a little more arid, but, but it just felt right. And so we, I thought, you know, we're going to come back and, and be the first person to plant Tempranillo in the state of Texas and found out I'd only missed that by about 25 years, <laughs> yeah. but, but you know, it's okay. Top 10 or something like that. Top 20. So we got it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Th so talking about the, you'd be able to drink bad beer all night. Mm -hmm. So it, in my old, my old days with, uh, with restaurants, you know, somebody would be like, I'm going to, I need a Bud Light or Miller Light, one of the other two. And so she, whether it's draft or not, and they've had like three or four by this point, and like we've we've blown the keg, we don't have any more. We'll give them the other one; they won't tell the difference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, they won't know. First beer, they'll tell. They always yeah. know. They always sure. know the first beer, yeah. especially if they drink it all the time. But after yeah. about the three, four beers, yeah, yeah, yeah they, they, Just, they don't care. This is beer, exactly. <laughs> especially so, if it's that 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 beer. Yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah, I, I, I've had. I think one Spanish beer and it's the, the Dam Estrella or mm -hmm. is it Dom? Estrella Dom. Yeah. yeah. Estrella Dom. I've had that. It was okay. But yeah. it's the only one I've, well, and I know there's done. two, there's two Estrellas. I did some research about it. Mm -hmm. It's like two that had the name Estrella. I think but they're owned by Heineken now. So probably, I think yeah, uh, yeah. Dom is owned by yeah. Heineken. The yeah. other one I can't remember. And they make like a non-alcoholic one, but Cruz yeah, Campo. they're not known for their beer. Cruz Campo. That was the one had this old, like kind of 1800s guy, like with his big mug. And it was just, I've had it since then, and they have learned a little bit more about refrigeration over there. And so it's, I can't say that I, I, I will recant my statement that Spanish beer is bad now. But as a 20 year old in 1999, it just, that, you know, they, it was wine, it was spirits. They, beer was there, but it just wasn't yeah. what the, the culture was. It's kind of like Italy. Yeah. They're yeah. not really known for their beer. Yeah. They make, I mean, yeah. they make okay beer, but that's, yeah, wine. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So, um, so you came back here and you decided to start this. Yeah. Or you, or you, you it was an existing winery, right? So, yeah. So it took a little detour, came back, uh, took a detour through law school, was in the music business for a little while. 
while and then iTunes became fully functional and record sales just, you know, plummeted. Yeah. So we made the reason, the decision to fire me as an everyday employee. And I always like to say, uh, got my mother and father and sister really, uh, really drunk a couple of times off wine and convinced them to, to go into business with me. And they've been regretting it ever since. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Nice. And, um, so you've got this place going, yeah. you've had it for a while. Um, I, I was here in 2009 mm -hmm. and I look at my photos. Apparently I was here in 2011 again, but sometimes, you know, I, iPhones and the photos, they kind of do weird duplication things. Sure. So sometimes the dates look really weird, but, but I guess I've been here a couple times yeah. and that's how I know we've met mm -hmm. and that's yep. how we met. Um, and I've, there's always been a long, long, long standing promise. I would actually come back and interview Ron and then you created another winery. We did. Cause you were crazy again. Yeah. So we, we, uh, <laughs> we bought Spicewood in 2007. Uh, the Manigolds had planted originally in 92, 93, 95, and we're kind of had been in it for 15 or 20 years and we're, and we're ready to, to move on. And we got really lucky. We, we bought this place cause we really wanted to have our hands in the dirt and there was a lot of room to expand. I believe there was about 17 acres existing when we bought the place and we ripped it down to about nine and then replanted up to about 30, 28 or 30 where we are right okay. now. Uh, and we ran out of production space. As you can see in here, it can get really tight. And the winemakers were really unhappy with me that they'd have to spend an hour pulling barrels out in the morning to do work and then spend an, an hour putting them back in. And uh, really that is kind of what spawned the other place. We were looking for uh, more production space. We looked over in this part of the world and we thought for sure land will be cheaper over here than it is over there. And magically really? it, it wasn't, it wasn't any cheaper. And so, okay. So we bought, uh, we bought, we bought that piece of property in, I believe the end of 2013 and what originally had been like, we'll just set up a, another Spicewood tasting room over there as well as making wines there. Uh, by that time we'd really gotten into the focus of what we were doing on the vineyard here at Spicewood. And so our, our movement is to, to make this place as close to, an estate winery as possible. I know we'll, you know, I don't have the crazy dreams that we, we grow around in Texas and there's some years like 2020 where, you know, you do 50 tons instead of 200 tons. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and so we, I don't ever have that, that far-fetched dream that we'll be a hundred percent estate here, but the intent is to get us as close to that as possible. Uh, and at, at Ron Yates, we like to focus, uh, all wines on, on the, the better growers in the state. We try to find the, the growers that are doing it the best in the state and show what we can do with, uh, other parts of, of the state growth okay. versus the hill country. All right. Yeah. yeah um, I, I had a thought now. I forgot what it was. I was just, it's just amazing that on the 290 trail that it would be not any more dramatically more expensive than yeah. land. Over I mean, it was 2012, 2013. It was before it yeah. you know, really topped out, but I just, what it just told me was land was just as expensive here as it is in there. So yeah. land pretty much in the hill country is <laughs> not cheap anymore. <laughs> so I, I've been by the winery a couple of times. As a matter of fact, I used the driveway as a turnaround a couple of years ago <laughs> to, to go to oh, another I was there winery. waving. I was like, Mark, yeah, come back. <laughs> Sorry. We, we were going, we were going to another amazing winemaker who uh, I'll hopefully interview a little bit later this year. Ben just didn't have any time with harvest going on, but uh, Ben Calais and um, crazy Frenchman, you oh, know, Benny. Come, coming to Texas, right? Making yeah. wine. But, um, so we missed, we missed the turn because mm -hmm. you couldn't see the French flag going east on 290. <laughs> so I, I knew we were there and somewhere in the flat, the, the, there's no obvious entrance or at least not to me. No, he, does, then, he did that on, does yeah. that on purpose. And then my, I was my like, out there. you can come on in. <laughs> and so then I see your wineries and we're going to turn around here. And I was with my dad and my aunt. I said, we're not going here. Eventually I'll come here. We're not going here today. And then driving the other way, I was like, oh yeah, I've seen that flag before. It was, yeah, it was. And then, uh, yeah, I had a little tasting with him, yeah. but yeah. Um, so we, we went out into the vineyards and, uh, I always like going into vineyards. It's a lot of fun doing that. And, uh, like I said, we flew the drone around, so I'll have some drone footage throughout, throughout the thing, which is what we took. And then anything I take next time within maybe a week or two, depending on what my, my personal life professional that I don't talk about on camera special. Uh, that was my way to say, we don't talk about where I work. Um, <laughs> as I, I sometimes forget to say pre interview mm -hmm. that we don't mention my employer, but anyway, so in the next like two, three weeks, I'll try to come up here and make a Please special do. trip, do, do, uh, some, uh, better. Maybe we'll get you over to Yates. Skies. Yeah, that'd be cool. There, yeah. we, we maybe start here and yeah. then go over to Yates. Um, cause I could take, it's not as, probably pretty over there, but you know, I could definitely do some drone footage there. Then sure. we can 
do yeah. wine. Yeah. So yeah, um, you, you could probably fly the drone inside the uh, ba- the winery if you really wanted to. You know, that would be cool. <laughs> Actually, I know it's 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 doable. The drone will say there's no GPS connection, sure. and the phone will say there's no GPS connection. But I know you can fly oh, crazy. my drone indoors. Inside. Wow. But yeah, you can't just like let it just do its own thing. No. But um, I don't know. I haven't tried it in the house yet. But <laughs> also, we don't have big wide open. Yeah, no, we don't. I, 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 yeah, we'll try it out. You know, yeah, I, I've always does. wanted to fly it inside, just kind of see if I ever get into real estate. Up and in through the barrels. Yeah, like if I do like real estate stuff and and want to mm-hmm. and like you know some five million dollar mansion fly because yeah. that's what they do. They sure. they'll have yeah, small yeah. drones and they'll do that. It's pretty amazing. And we would digress. So about how many different, uh, on, on this property, about how many different grapes are you doing? Nine or 10 varieties. I can't remember. Uh, the, major- the Tempranillo is the most planted. Behind that, Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, behind that is probably Graciano. And then some Carignan, some Cabs, some Syrah. Uh, so we've got a little bit of a Viognier, some Muscat, and then a tiny bit of Simeon and some Merlot. I think that's it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. So we... So I said we were getting moved. So we went across the street because that was the, really the drone shot I wanted to do. And um, another reason why I have to come back is apparently the panorama didn't work. I didn't. I guess I didn't hit record. I don't know. It should have done it automatically. Uh-huh. But and then on the way back to this side, you made. You, we were talking about soil. So kind of talk about that yeah. and, and just how it just worked out. So we kind of have uh, kind of. Uh, it's hard to see when you're right in the tasting room, but if you take a kind of a larger view, we're really coming down from some hills behind us and that kind of gathers in the creeks, which flow into Lake Travis. And the higher up on the, the southern part of the of the property is more of a sandy loam soil. In fact, actually, where the Syrah is planted, those east-west rows at the very back, it's like a sand volleyball pit. It's really yeah. sandy. Uh, and as we go down that hill, you get to more of, of a sandy loam and then you get really to randomly kind of right where the the road crosses between the two vineyards and you go across and it really starts to, bec- to become a clay bottom because it's at where everything is has drained over time and it's more of a clay and a clay silt so we tend to keep all of the the the, the varieties that want the drainable that like you said that don't want wet feet try yeah. to keep try to keep them up on the on the south part so that you have all that good drainage and then keep the spanish and portuguese grapes on the other side where there tends to be more clay which holds more moisture which just kind of helps them kind of more what they're used to okay all right, so we took a little break here because the chiller came on and I wanted to try to eliminate as much sound as possible. Also, we all have the, there's echo and everything. Yeah. So there's there's little fun things you can do in in, in post-production to minim, uh, mitigate these things. So, But it, I'll leave a little bit of the echo in because right. it sounds good. So, so yeah, so it, you ha- we were kind of talking about it's kind of like a premier crew, grand crew type yeah. of thing. Yeah, it's like you know, we, we were – we took um, – for my mother's 50th birthday, we went out to, to – uh, got to go to Romani Conti and start oh. with their, with their, their you know, grand crew, the premier crew, grand crew, and all the way down to Village and see it. Sometimes you're like, that's really – like 15 feet across the road. And they're like, yeah, it's, less, it's not as good as right over here. Yeah. I'm like, you, okay. All right. I've, I've been there. Yeah. I've, I've been, I've been to Burgundy and I, you know, there aren't really any vineyards on the east side of the roads or yeah. few, but if they, if they have them, if they're not that, they're not the premier crew. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's like, I think there's one premier crew vineyard on the east side of seven RN 74 or D seven, 974, whatever the actual official name of it is now. Yeah. Um, and I forgot which don't, it's a flash card. I should know this off the top of my head, but I don't, but it's, I want to say it's like a new St. George or like that. And I don't remember the name of the, of the, of the, of the, of the crew, but it was like yeah. one, everything else. Premier and Gron is on the West side of all yep. that. And yeah, I, I have a picture in front of the cross. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Monte Conti. Yeah. I did yeah. that. Um, but yeah, um, it, it's, it's, it was kind of funny because you were talking about the soils and over there. It's like the road kind of is the divider. It is. Um, but in this case, oh. you have quality on both sides. That's true. That's true. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it, to, to us, to us, both both sides are, are great for different reasons. You know, yeah. we and, and we we ironically have a little bit of Sauvignon Blanc planted across the way that you saw today in the very far east part of the property where it is probably the most clay soil, and it does really well. Uh, it's very different flavors than what you get out of the Sauvignon Blanc across the road. And it's only a very tiny amount. So we yeah. like to blend that back in for some complexity, but it's been, it's been fun to, 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 I was concerned that it might not do as well. And it, it has done very well, but w- you can tell that the better spot for planting that Sauvignon Blanc was, was in the sandy, sandy loam versus the clay. Perfect. So, um, 
we at the, we at the point we should be tasting wine or you yeah? To, I mean, I'm, got, all, I'm always at the point <laughs> where we should be tasting the wine. It, it's five o'clock all day long, yeah. right? It's five o'clock in, in Spain. I probably or should somebody have that like over that. Here. Yeah, you should. <laughs> you should have that because you'll probably be doing more of that than me. I'll, I'll be doing a little bit of driving here in a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Now. So, so speaking of. Yeah. So the first one we're trying today is our uh, 2019 Estate Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, like just like we were talking about, this little guy is one of my favorite wines that we produce. Uh, and a fun little story about this Sauvignon Blanc: when we bought the uh, we bought the property from the Manigolds, they had uh, made Sauvignon Blanc. They'd made wine in 04 and had sold all of the grapes in 05 and 06. And so everybody had always said one of the best wines they make is the Sauvignon Blanc. And I kind of like in the hill country, I bet. <laughs> but, there, but there was none to taste because they had because it was all you know three years since they'd made it and it was all sold. So we just had to trust them and we ripped out them. We ripped out some Zinfandel, some Cap Franc, some Riesling, some stuff that really had no business being planted here other than it just because they loved it. Yeah. And and we decided to leave the Sauvignon Blanc because it was fruiting. And we decided, hey, you know, we'll make it for a couple of years. And when everything we planted gets to fruition, we'll rip that out and start over. And I, we made our first one in 07 and won a bunch of medals with it. And we're like, hmm, I think we make Sauvignon Blanc. <laughs> and, you know, so, but this is our 2019 version, 100% stainless, a uh, little bit of Sir Lee there. Bottled probably about probably five months, four or five months in stainless before it was bottled. Mm -hmm. Nice, crisp, quick. And this is very classic for our, our Sauvignon Blanc. What it replicates. It's it's. This is. I mean, this is something. If you're if you're you know doing a blind tasting, you, first of all, it's obvious it's Sauvignon Blanc, right? Mm -hmm. And then you're. And then to me, it's like, well, it's not a Sancerre, it's not a white Bordeaux, but. You know, it's, it's definitely got the new worldness to it, but there's definitely a, a, a good uh, complexity to it. There's good winemaking going on. You get good fruit. So it's not like, yeah, yeah, it's just some, you know, Sauvignon mm -hmm. Blanc that, you know, whatever. I mean, you're you're putting an effort into this. Yeah. And it tastes really good. Thank you. We, yeah. We, I love, this usually starts, starts off the tasting list and not, we don't have it as much in the past years because people have started to find out that we can actually make quality wines in the state. Mm -hmm. But five, six, seven years ago, people would show up with kind of, we're going to do a tasting with some Texas wines. And we start them off with the Sauvignon Blanc and you could immediately see the, the complexion change. Like, are they, or they kind of look at each other and go like, you know, yeah. like, wow, this is really good. And then that was great to start the tasting that way. Cause it just totally shifts their thinking when they walked in. I mean, like I said, now, you don't get that that much more. Most people are understanding of what we can and cannot do, but it was fun those few years to see and the, 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 like, whoa, the look on people. And then, then it would immediately fine tune them into the, for the rest of the tasting versus just kind of, yeah. you know, out and trying some wines and, and talking to the friends, but it's always a great, great little setup wine. And I think it's one of the better things that we do, but I'm biased. Well, yeah, you should be, <laughs> right? So yeah, it, to me, it's like, um, especially if you're going to start off with this and when you, and the early the early years, this is a grape that people know what it is. They know what it should taste like. You know, there, there's a, there's a, um, most of the, most of the places in the, around the world, the grape tastes, not that it's the same, but there's enough of familiarity. Yeah. You're like, that's Sauvignon Blanc. It's got that Sauvignon Blanc yeah. that funk on the nose. It's just delicious. So, yeah, I mean, and especially when you have like wineries that are, you know, having, and we're going to get into these varieties mm -hmm that aren't as familiar to, especially Texas consumers, yeah. um, you have something that's familiar that you're doing really well, you know, and, um, and we can go, well, not you and I, but <laughs> we as a collective with Texas, uh, can go back and forth about what, you know, what does well, what doesn't do well. Sure. But you know, the, the bottom line is for like 30, 40 years, we stuck with the stuff that everybody knew mm -hmm. name wise and with various levels of success. And now that we have people who are like going to take chances on Texas wine, mm -hmm. now we can, now we can play. Yeah. We can, oh, yeah. we can do what we're about to Well, yeah, that, yeah. That, that's funny. You said that that's all, that's kind of what I was alluding to there. It, it, it just, it always gave us that legitimacy because you're like, you could 90, if you know anything about Sauvignon Blanc, 90% of the people could smell that and go, Hmm, that's Sauvignon Blanc. And it's a really tough gro grape to grow in the heat because of all the vigor. And it wants to grow and grow and grow and grow. And I believe until recently there was only about 
10 or 15 acres in the entire state of Sauvignon okay. Blanc. I know some people have expanded growth and I'm not sure what it is now, but for a long time we were, the, our, our six acres of Sauvignon Blanc was by far the largest planting of it. And I know that uh, there was a few vineyards here and there on the Martin Vineyard up in the High Plains. I know Nara now has some, but it just wasn't, I think, it just wasn't a lot of Sauvignon Blanc to be found. And right. I, I, I kind of relished in that, that we did it really well and not a lot of other people do it, but I love that grape. It's one of, it's probably, other than Albarino, it's probably my favorite white wine grape to drink. Okay. And so are you doing, we're going to get a little geeky here. Mm -hmm. um, are, are you doing things like dropping fruit to kind of reduce your yield because of the vigor or are you just kind of letting it go? And, well, we, we uh, in, as the vines have aged, mm -hmm. it, the vigor has dropped off right, a lot. Yeah. And, uh, but in those younger ones, yeah, it's, there's a lot of hedging. There's a lot. I mean, there's really... Our soils don't carry a whole lot of fruit in the first place. That's kind of what we liked about this place is we, you know, we're two, two tons an acre probably. That's, maybe. That, that, yeah, yeah, that's already yeah, yeah. a good, yeah, like you're yeah. already restricting a lot. And you know, we will go in there and drop secondary buds and, and hedge. And, you know, when we, when we, uh, purchased for the manigolds, I was in there one day, we were, uh, uh, taking out some of the, the vines that just needed to be repaired. And there were 50 foot bull canes with the Sauvignon Blanc from when it was younger. You don't really see that as those vines age, they slow uh -huh. down, start focusing a little more on the fruit production, but yeah, you have to be some leaf pulling. You got to be on, especially in wet years, you got to be on top of the Sauvignon yeah. Blanc. Yeah. Let's well, kind of talk about the wet years. Cause you're showing me that you have uh, some issues with Pierce's mm -hmm. disease, which in Texas is pretty, it's a pretty major thing, especially hill country. Yeah. Um, It'll be shortened to PD a lot of times. And you, first you said PD, I was like, PD. Like, oh, yeah, Pierce and Pierce's disease. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so kind of talk about that as, as a challenge out here in Hill yeah, Country. I mean, it's, it's, if you, you, it's, you know, it's really, really can be site specific. Uh, I know my cousins at Fall Creek uh, lost their vineyards two or three times. And yeah. they're a lot of, uh, from what I've been told from them is that, that being right next to a lake, to a big body of water is not the best thing in the world. Uh, really, our PD kind of showed up in 2015, like we were talking about, I believe. We had 52 inches of rain on Memorial Day weekend in 2015 and all the flooding and everything. And so it just, there was abundance of water and, uh, and the little, the little glassy wing sharpshooter came around and, and, you know, we, we don't like him very much, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I think, uh, I think there's been some progress that's being made and, you know, there's in fact, uh, uh, the Carter Creek winery just planted the new PD resistant vines okay. over there off 290. And that's going to be fun to a whole bunch of new, new vines that it, hopefully are going to, uh, pre prevent that. But, you know, it's just, I think in, in the hill country, it's just something, if you want to grow grapes, if you're dumb enough to grow grapes in the hill country, it's something you got to deal with and be, yeah. try to be preventative about, but just know until we get a, till we get a real, uh, a real application that can help it. It's just something we're going to have to deal with. Yeah. And he, so we talked about Fall Creek and, and if you were a long, long, long time viewer, you saw that I, 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 interviewed the Allers who were awesome. And during, I don't think it was during the interview, but it was during the mm -hmm. visit, they, they had mentioned you. And I was like, what? And I, I, I had, I think I'd already, I had already visited here. So yeah. I was like, Ron, he's what? He's like nephew, right? Uh, uh, so my dad cousin. and Ed are cousins. Yeah, yeah, yeah cousins, yeah. 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 It, it, it's not like, you know, no. grandparents or whatever, but Ed's there's mom, definitely- Ed's mom was a Yates. Yeah. yeah. So there, there's, there's definitely, you know, so we, we have this kind of, you know, at least between, between your two families, yeah. we have like a little like dynasty thing going oh, yeah. on. Yeah. Well, we went, I'll tell the fun story <laughs> real quick. We went in 2007, uh, we decided we, when we really, when dad was like, well, I think we're, we're going to do this. So we went to meet Ed in his office and he was like, don't do it. Like, well, <laughs> will you have any advice for us? Don't do it. Don't, <laughs> yeah. don't do it. Why, why would you want to get into this business? And we obviously did not heed his, uh, his call, but, uh, that was, you know, things were different in 07, you know, people would. Mm -hmm. When people, all my friends are like, you're doing what? You're getting into, you're going to make wine in Texas? Why? Why? And there was like <laughs> easily less than a hundred, probably less than 50 actually bonded wine. Oh yeah. I, I would imagine it was probably somewhere state. close yeah. to that. Yeah. We had, when I first started in the wine trail, there were 16, when we bought Spice, but I think there were 16 wineries on the Hill Country Wine Trail. Yeah. And it was, you know, Becker, Pedernales, Grape Creek, uh, Chori. Texas, uh, Texas yeah. Hills, Torre de Pietra, yeah. and you, know, you could start naming them all. Yeah. And uh, uh, Alamosa, you know, it, yeah. it was, it was, it was, uh, it was much smaller and much more, uh, you know, a close knit, I would say. Now it's, you know, I don't even know half the people that, that own new, new wineries. And it's great. You know, I liked it. I really enjoyed 
the kind of camaraderie of, of all these, all these people that have just getting started doing it and me getting in. I'm glad that I was one. I feel like, you know, by no means were we in the first round, but still, I feel like we are like veterans at this point. Are. We've been yeah. here for 13 years and, and we were here before it really became, you know, cool to be doing the Texas wine. So I, I, I'm proud about that. Yeah. I, I mentioned uh, yesterday over at Slate Mill that, you know, it, I don't come up here all the time, but every time I come up to the Hill Country, it's like there's a new winery. Oh. Not just one, just like new wineries in the scene, billboards. And it's like – and and some of them aren't directly on 290, mm -hmm. but yeah. And it's it's hard for me to keep up with you know everything that's going on um, with it. I mean, granted, I'm also trying to study the entire world, but <laughs> yeah. you know, it's yeah. just yeah. like – You got some other things who? going on. Who? Which one is that? Yeah, so yeah. it's – it can be a um, – Oh, that's kind of funny. So the metal conducted the well, – I won't get into the to the science of it, but with touchscreens, the metal actually conducted it. That was actually kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> that is cool. So um, anyway, um, yeah, it, there's always new stuff coming up here with with wineries. Uh, you know, this is a really nice one. All right, so what else are we going to have here? Well, I figured and we'd do that since we only got – I'd do uh, the rosé in that same glass, and then mm -hmm. we'd have uh, – a new glass okay. for all the red wines. All right. This is our 2019 Grenache Rosé. This fruit comes from farmhouse vineyards up in okay. the high I've plains. Met those people. Yeah, Nick and Katie Jane and all those wonderful folks. I uh, ate Whataburger and drank wine with them one there night. There we go. There we go. <laughs> uh, this uh, their vineyard is really just down the road from uh, from the the custom crush facility up there testing and we we had it harvested and i believe the day we got there it was you know it was straight there and there was nobody in line so it was pressed almost immediately and we really wow, yeah, love really light we really love that light color that's you know we we, we make some tempranillo rosé as well that we tend to do on the darker side that sometimes is, is ble uh, bleed off some saunier or how, if you will but this specifically picked early for rosé it's about i think it's about 13 percent alcohol yeah Okay. And it's, it's got just, just for, for the days we've been having today, it's, you know, it's a little chilly, but, uh, I'm an equal opportunity rose, rose drinker. I could, I'm rose every day, man. You know, I don't care you know what it. time of year it is. Yeah. To me, rose is an outstanding fall wine. It's mm -hmm. a great, it's a great Thanksgiving wine, oh, yeah. a great wine for any type of like fall, winter holiday stuff, or just, just a drink. Um, mm. this is delicious. Thank you. Yeah. That little wild strawberry. Yeah. In there. Yeah. Thank you for the fruit, guys. Mm hmm Yeah. Nice acidity. They picked early, right? You're you're picking it early for Oh yeah, this is probably picked at twenty two and a half, maybe. Twenty two. Okay. Yeah, maybe maybe a little higher than that, but that's the goal. Somewhere okay. between twenty two or twenty three to All right. get a little less little color, more acidity, so makes your makes your mouth water. Yeah. So if you don't know, you're talking about bricks and um, that's just sugar level in, in fruit. It's not just grapes. Um, so yeah, when you're getting into that 24, 25, 26, that's when you're getting into that ripeness level that is right. may not be phenolically ripe and we won't get too geeky with it, but you have your sugar ripeness and your acid hopefully is, hasn't yeah. dropped too bad. But yeah, with something like this, you know, you want, do you want the higher acidity? Sure. And because uh, you get that great freshness and brightness to it, it's it's really nice. And that's why it was fun. We're trying mostly 17s today, and seven, okay. 17 was that year where the dirty secret where the hurricane came into Houston and it sucked all of the moisture out of the state and brought down all the cold rocky Rocky Mountain air. And I believe yeah. I believe we were harvesting uh, this wine on uh, on like September 10th or 11th of that year, and it was 84 degrees mm. in the high plains. And it was 102 that day in Hillsburg. I remember being yeah. like, wow, that's a, that's a little different. It's usually the other way around. Yeah, I tell you, man. Well, I mean, in, in, well, I don't know about the high plains, but out yeah. here, around that time of year, um, the weather tends to get a little bit better as far as temperature-wise. Yeah. So, yeah. At least, at least, but not 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 eighty four degrees. No, not yeah. eighty four. This and like today, I mean, yeah. it's going to be like a high of like maybe seventy something. Mm -hmm. But you know, we had we had we had a cold front come through. Yeah. Um, we're luckily not getting like the feet and feet of snow that Colorado is no, getting, but it's basically no. I guess the same system. Yep, we're getting all this rain. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's going to be really chilly. Like I had my I had my hoodie, 
Uh, I didn't wear it out in the vineyard because I didn't want it for the shot. But oh. anyway, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely chilly outside. I, I can't tell you how happy I am to yeah. have a hoodie on. It's I told Ron, it was like, it felt like I was in, back in Oregon from the end of last year because it was yeah. nice and cool out. Yeah, and it wasn't quite as rainy, but yeah, yeah it had that coolness. Yeah, yeah uh, this is this is absolutely delicious. Thank you. This is, uh, we, we started making rosé out of this in 18 and this year, every, every bit of it went to rosé and pet nat just because we love what it does. It's, it's tough. Grenache is tough to get color. Yeah, you know, Grenache is tough to get color in the classic places mm -hmm. it's yeah. grown. It's really tough to get color here in Texas. We, uh, we planted it actually in 2008 originally here and it just, we planted it twice here in two different right. locations and it just would not take. It did not, it did not want to grow here. Yeah, um, that's one of the things, you know, uh, when we're doing our blind tastings, that um, when we see something with a little bit lighter color and then we're then we're doing smelling and tasting, um, if we think it's like Chef de Neuf or a Grenache-based wine, mm -hmm. and, you know, the color is what – the color kind of gives, gives it away you. a little bit or at least puts you in that direction. You know, sometimes it, you're off and – I know we're going to get to a wine. We're going to talk color here because I'm going to bring up something from a few weeks ago. So, yeah, um, hopefully remind you about that. But yeah. I'll remember when we get to that wine. I'm sure we have it, right? Uh, yeah, I've, got, I've, got the, I've got the good guy version of that, yeah. which is and, 50%. And yeah. That was, yeah, that, was, yep. that, was, that was the sneaky one there. Anyway, <laughs> so what else do we have over here? Ah, so next on the list is our – uh, it's our 2017 tandem blend. Todd, our our wonderful. Oh, I put that over there. Yeah, no, in there. Todd, uh, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> Todd, our wonderful winemaker at both locations. Todd and Reagan uh, are just doing really killer stuff with the Iberian Peninsula grapes and the the, the Italian Sangiovese as well. Uh, but we'd really been uh, impressed with what uh, everybody else was doing with these Rhone wines. We make okay. a little bit of more Ved, and we'd made some some Grenache, but we nobody we noticed nobody was making uh, uh, blends really. I mean, I'm okay. sure they were. We just didn't we just didn't notice them, and so we decided back in 2013, I believe, we were going to start making uh, a Rhone blend every year for two grapes. So we we play around every year with Grenache, Morved, Syrah, and Carignan. So okay. the blend the blend changes for this wine, and I don't know if you can see it, but on the the label there, it's a tandem bicycle that only has one seat and the handlebars face the opposite way. Okay, yeah. Because we can never agree on uh, what the two grapes are going to be from the four. Uh, okay. You know, we have we have a it's it's kind of fun. We on the the Tempranillos and the the Tarigas and that and that kind of stuff. We I, we all tend to have a really similar idea of what we think the direction we want to go mm -hmm. but we always it, this is so fun because everybody's kind of always got a little different idea but you know we let we let todd roll with it because because okay. he's the man so uh in 2017 this is 55 percent carignan and 45 percent morvet all right Car carignan comes from uh buena suerte uh, vineyards up in the high plains and the morved comes from the binghams so right pretty close to each other there bill day at, at uh at buena suerte and the binghams there for the patent block of the morved and it was just it was it, this is the first time we've done carignan and morved it's a lighter style wine as you can see but i think the complexities in here are are amazing the subtleties in this wine really really make me dig it yeah So again, so basically, uh, uh, GSM plus and so, right? Yeah, you know. Okay. Uh, well, Grena this is oh, Car yeah. Carignan and Morved. Yeah, yeah. So. Carignan and Morved. And Morved, yeah. yeah. We uh, we didn't in seventeen. The Syrah went. Well, yeah. There's another one of those years where we we all we all loved everything, and and we just you know Todd wanted to do Carignan right. and Morved because he thought that would uh, be the best combo, and he was probably right. So really good spicy characteristics on this, and you've got that kind of really tart red fruit, like mm -hmm. um, like raspberry, a little bit of cranberry, cherry. Um, yeah, it's not over right. It's, yeah, it's got really good acidity. It's really bright. It's refreshing. Mm -hmm. There's a rusticity to it. Um, this is a wine that I would. So sometimes there's like wines that just have a like Texasness to mm -hmm. it, and this has that. It's it's hard for me to describe specifically in flavors and aromas, but yeah, I guess that I guess that, yeah. that battery is just dead gone. anyway. Luckily, that's the camera on me. So. <laughs> um, but anyway, as as uh, I'm dealing with technical issues, um, 
No, I, I know what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, but I think that comes from the Morved. Okay. To me, that I, that's what I, I'll and, and Morved that's not really pushed in ripeness to me. I get that like that Texas thing. And I, don't, I don't think it's a, a negative. It's just I mm-hmm. think it's a determination of it helps you of what it is. For me, you know, I, I I like being able to say there's something Texas about the wine because that way we're we're expressing terroir mm-hmm. and not just you know, well, we're just trying to make it taste we're just trying to make it taste like this. Well, no, well, I mean if there's yeah. a if there's terroir, there's terroir. Let's 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 you know mm-hmm. let's embrace that. So yeah, I think it's I think it's really nice as I just put some adjustments here on my on my side there. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. That's the fun part about this blend is it changes every year. Uh, the, the 2018, I think, is Syrah and Morvet. I mean, uh, Grenache and Morvet, mm-hmm. you know, and it, and in 2019, we just bottled it was Carignan and Morvet again, I believe. So, right. Or maybe it was Grenache and Carignan, actually. I can't remember off, off the top of my head anymore. <laughs> so many blends. Yeah, there's like a little bit of like I won't want to say it's like almost like a little chili pepperiness, mm-hmm. you know, not yeah. not like spicy spicy, but like there's like a there's some spices to it, and that you definitely get from those Rhone style mm-hmm. varieties, yep. especially when you're kind of in the Southern Rhone thing when you have those those blends. Oh, I get like that herbs to herbs yeah. and Provence, yeah, like that, crazy. yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. There's definitely an herbaceousness to it. It's really nice. That's what I, that's what I was talking about earlier. Like that's why I really dig this wine because it's lighter, it's softer, but it's and, but it's still it's got that red tart fruit. It's got or it's got all kinds of different complexities to it. Mm-hmm. And and I think sometimes in Texas with our shorter growing season, fruit can be one dimensional and you know not really super complex. And I think that that's fun to be able to be that complex out of just two grapes. It's yeah, got a lot going on. And, exactly. Very cool. I like that yeah, wine. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Hmm. I'm gonna put the glass down. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. We're move on. Yes. Move on. So this is a fun one. I don't even have a name for this yet. It has a working title. Okay. Uh, we made this blend back in 2008 and 2009 and 2010. Uh, from a vineyard in Round Mountain that we used to farm that okay. Doug Lewis now farms called Round Mountain Vineyards. Uh, and we would always blend Tariga and Tempranillo together. This is from here in the Hill Country. We have, uh, this is 50% our estate Tempranillo from 2017. Okay. And then 50% our estate Tariga from the EB Vineyard, which is about seven or eight miles west of here in Round Mountain. Uh, we've always had uh, difficulty with this because these two want to compete they like you do the blend and it's like, I can taste Tarrigo over here and Tempranillo over here. And it yeah. coalesce is a word I like to use it. Never, it never really seemed to fit together. Uh, we bottled this and it's just been in the bottle now for two years. And finally, you know, it's starting to, to really come together and feel, uh, you know, together and, and like, and, and, and one instead of, you know, Hey, we got two grapes in here. You can taste on either side. We could never come up with a name. So the working title right now is Castilian Succession because it was a huge, huge war between Portugal and Spain back in the okay. 14 or 1500s, I believe. And so all the, so that's, that's the working title right now, but it's 50% Tempranillo, 50% Tariga Nacional all right. uh, from here in the hill country off the vineyards that we work and farm. So I, I like this a lot. There's some really nice uh, red fruit. This is a more of a riper version fruit. It's mm-hmm. not that tartness. Um, and it, it's, I would call it like a raspberry, a little dark cherry to it. Yeah, raspberry for sure. You know, a little, um, well, again, it's a little bit of herbaceousness. There's, mm-hmm. there's kind of a mintiness to it. Sure. There's also a little bit of chocolate to it. Yeah, this has been a fun one because it, it it really, like I said, we tried it about six months ago and we were kind of like, oh, it's nice. But, you know, of course, we're we're hypercritical about things that we do, but uh, it just it just hadn't really, you know, it still it still doesn't have a label yet because we just weren't sure how it was going to how right, it was going to yeah. come around. And I think in the last few months it's really come around. And and I think that shows that we really have in Texas more of that old war, old ward 
Ugh, I can't speak. Old, Old world, world yeah. terroir. Like, you know, we don't make a lot of wines that are like 12 months in a, 11 months in a barrel, six months in a bottle. It's a big pack punch. And it's ready to go. You know, I think our, at least that's what I've learned over, over our time. We age, you know, like I said, most of these wines are just about to come out. Mm-hmm. This one has already come out. These have just come out, but the other four, three, four red wines are still, they will be by the time this airs, they will be released. But yeah. we like to let our wines age in the bottle before we release them. So you're not getting that really young stuff. Cause I, I believe with the Texas wines, the longer, you know, if the Oak program is, is proper and done like it should be, we can a- make ageable wines and ageable wines that get better five, six, seven years down the road than, than uh, where they are right from the start. And this really has an older world feel like, you know, the fruit was really ripe on the, on the, on the front end, on the, on the nose. But when you taste it, there's a tartness to it. Mm-hmm. It doesn't finish completely tart, but there's a tartness to it. Um, and speaking about age wine, so last year I went out to the hill, not hill, to high, the high plains, and I had the I had the opportunity to hang out with Bobby Cox, and he pulled stuff from his first run with mm-hmm. um, Pheasant, Pheasant Ridge, Ridge yeah, yep. and it was like uh, something from the '80s, something like that. Yeah. It was like a cab. I want to say it was older. I'd have to look it up. I'll, 80, I'll, I think 84 or 83 was his first vintage. Okay, so I think it was maybe, like 80, 80, maybe 82, you know, but... It might have been like an 87. It was like, mm-hmm. I think, mid to late 80s. Yeah. I have a picture of it. I'll try to put it up on, on here. And we tasted it, and he was like, yeah, that's what I did. Bobby's awesome. <laughs> um, he's, 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 he's a character. Anyway, so we're tasting it, and uh, I was like, What? Like it was the definitely the oldest Texas wine I've ever had, mm-hmm. and I don't drink a lot of wines from the '80s just in general. Yeah. And so we tasted it, and he was like, "Here you go, take it." And I was like, oh. yeah. and, "And he sells other stuff that's of a that has yeah. age on it." And I I happened to glance at the at the menu, and it wasn't the same wine, but it's I think it was actually older. Yeah. And. What he gave you was older than was on the menu, and he was charging like a couple hundred bucks for that for his well, I believe, eighty something. Wine. I believe his eighty three was the first Texas wine to yeah. win a gold medal at a California wine competition that won gold, and it got like I think it was ninety points for a long time. It was the first Texas wine that I was aware of that yeah. had had ninety points or higher. So, so hey, thanks, Bobby. Yeah, I mean it. Yeah, again, you we can age wine too. We can make good mm-hmm. wine. We can age wine. And like everywhere else, there's also wine that's just ordinary and is not meant to age. Yeah, that's, that's right. We drink well, early, you know. That's right. It's okay. Yeah. Mm. That's gonna be fun. Mm-hmm. That's a nice little combination. Mm. All right. Moving on. Yeah, moving on. So this is obviously if you haven't. Listen, yet I dig Tempranillo. I really dig Tempranillo. We grow it in uh, two different places in the hill country. I think four or five people grow it for us in the high plains. That's kind of the grape, obviously, with Spain that made me really want to be a Texas winery. You know, I when I got here, when I, I first, I believe the first phone call I ever made was to Dan Gatlin mm-hmm. from Inwood, and he kind of told him what I wanted to do, and told He's him another character, <laughs> another character, yeah. And and you know, I guess Neil, he had Neil Newsom plant Tempranillo back in the '80s before anybody else did. Uh, and, and then I, I talked to him and talked to Jim Johnson at Alamosa Cellars because he had been Becker's winemaker for a while and started mm-hmm. his own deal. And they both really helped convince me that we could do Tempranillo in the state. And so once I'd had those conversations and got even more full bore on it, uh, it we've been uh, we planted a whole bunch of Tempranillo. This particular one is our 2017 High Plains Tempranillo. This comes from John Friesen's Vineyard up in uh the town's called Loop, but it's kind of between Welch and uh, I mean between La Mesa and Brownfield on the way okay. up in the High Plains. All right, uh, this is a fun one for yeah. us. We don't typically we our High Plains uh, wines. We tend to do shorter uh, growing seasons. Am I short a glass? I think we may have to short a glass. We may have to double up. Sorry, uh, I we, think we kind of already doubled up because this was. I think this one here. I think that was actually my rosé. Right, well, because you know, <laughs> I kind of moved fine. them around, that's but we're fine. good. We're good. It's okay. We're yeah. professionals. But uh, we t- <laughs> we tend to do the high plains, a little fresher style, 11, okay. 12 months, thirty percent new oak instead of like the good guy for the estate Tempranillo we tried the other day on the on the tasting. 
those are ten, those tend the estate stuff tends to be 50% new French and you know 18 to 19 months duration. And we like to try to do the high plains a little a little fresher. I'll brag a little bit on this one. Uh, we just won at the San Francisco Chronicle wine competition this year. We just won double gold and best of class with this wine. So. I've been bragging about that a little bit, yeah. but you'll see, notice this has got a little, it's still, it's still got some really nice body. It's still about 14, 8% alcohol. It's a big wine, but it's got lush fruit on the front compared to uh, some of our state stuff like this. Like you said, it's got that tart fruit and more of that herbs and that dustiness. This really is just, you know, I hate to tell people what they taste when they drink wine, but I always tell people, if you're not tasting blackberry cobbler, you're not drinking this wine. Yeah. <laughs> Mm. And John grows a bunch of grapes for us, mostly at Yates, at Ron Yates. But uh, we had a lot of fruit in 17, so we decided to do this in a little different style. We'll we'll cold soak and tank for, tank ferment most everything, so you can really get that soak on it, chill it down, get a lot of that fruitiness out. This was bin fermented, so this was in bins with no temperature control. Okay, you got to start fermentation a little bit early, uh, and it was we we ended up. We were, you know, was, it, we did it. They were such dynamically different wines. We decided we're going to continue that one, oak it differently, and and make it for spicewood. And we've been really happy. And it's fun because you can go over to Yates and see the same fruit and diametrically different because it's it, it was tank fermented. It was aged for for 16 or 17, 18 months in much more new French oak, long duration, and it's I got a little more elegance to it. Whereas this one's kind of like juicy punch you in the mm -hmm, face. Yeah. Let's ha let's have a good time. So with the so I got to see kind of when I was in Oregon, they had like bins. They would have the, them sitting outside. They have, they have like tents. They mm -hmm. sit them outside, mm -hmm. and the fermentation starting there. But it's cold enough yeah. that it's not. We that, can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> is that like so? Those bins are probably like down here or whatever sure. or somewhere. Oh yeah, their yeah. bins are in temperature controlled yeah. areas. And uh, well, well, I mean, it depends. You get them to the end. We may pull them out, let them be in the sun for a little bit. Maybe get some of that if the fermentation slows down a little right, bit. Yeah. Maybe help kick it up, but. Usually, if there, that happens, if the, you're usually outside, but still in the shade, mm -hmm. you know. But yeah, no, but a lot of the bin fermentation in California and Washington and Oregon happens outside because they need a little more heat to get everything going. Yeah, they they can they can get away with it. Yeah. So you may mention you may have heard mentioned during pet analysis, we had this little thing, Zoom thing, and we were supposed to blind taste and guess wines, and I thought I was gonna be all smart and game the system a little bit and be like. Um, not that I, so everything was blind. We had, we had paper bags over it and there was all, and we knew we had five wines I mean five wineries and mm -hmm. a part of the Texas fine wine thing. So we already knew the group, but we didn't know which one was which. And then we would go through each wine and they would reveal who it was. And one wine I knew because I just happened to glance through, it was, you know, a clear thing. It had a pattern analysis. So I was like, okay, well that's wine number. I think it was, were they four. the last one? There were four. There were four. Yeah. So I was like, okay. No, 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 take it back. No, no, there right. were five. There were five. five. Yeah, Dukeman was, was four. Dukeman was four. We were three. You were three. You were three. Dukeman did those. the GSM. Yeah. And, yeah. So, so I was like, okay, well. Oh, and I also knew I, in in the next the next episode where I'm going next, Brennan, they had a very distinctive cap, and I knew that was Brennan, and I so I made an assumption it was something, and it wasn't, and you know, I was like. Damn it, it's Viognier. Like I should know that. <laughs> That's what they do. But I thought it was Lily. Yeah. I, I, to be fair, I thought it, I thought it was Lily too. Cause, yeah. Because uh, their Todd always does some fun stuff in the winery, and I thought that to me that reminded of the Lily I'd had in the past. Yeah. But it was delicious. And I mean, but uh, is it Todd, Todd's Instagram um, handle. Yeah, Todd is like Texas Viognier. Texas Viognier, yeah, yeah. I, I should know. Well, I mean, they won. They won. The, <laughs> Brennan won the, the one of the first Texas wines I ever had. Speaking of Bobby Cox, Bobby Cox uh, helped source that fruit and helped Dr. Brennan make that wine, I believe, uh, when he first got started. But their 06 Viognier won the saddle at Houston Rodeo. And I remember drinking that wine. I was at my sister's wedding in Santa Fe and my sister married a guy from Comanche and who his family was good friends with, uh, with the, the Brennans. And we had this wine and it just blew me away. I was like, and I, 
I'd never really been, you know, Sauvignon Blanc's my white wine. If I'm going to drink Sauvignon Blanc, Albarino, something crisp, refreshing. Viognier just, and I'd only had French Viognier. And it was like, oh, you know, it smells like perfume and rose yeah. petals. It yeah. smells like grandma's house. You know, it's yeah. not nothing bad. It just wasn't, was my, it wasn't yeah. my jam. Yeah. And I remember sitting down and we had a, at the re- rehearsal dinner, there was, all these different wines and I kept being like, no, I want more of that. That doesn't go with that. Like, but I, I want more of that. Yeah. And it blew me away. It was an incredible wine. And I totally changed my, my thoughts on Viognier and, yeah. and it was, it was delicious. So, yeah. So we get to Ron's wine and, uh, like I said, a couple episodes ago, they gave us a choice of three and I kind of looked at them. I was like, now the Tempranillo, that's going to be Pedernalis. I know that's what they're going to put out. <laughs> so, so it's not Tempranillo. And then it says Tempranillo. So that gets us to the story of, yeah. So I go, uh, so I typed my question to Ron. I was like, hey, I noticed like there's like a little bit of like browning or orange, and, but it's like a young Tempranillo. And, and that was, so I think that's why I went with Sangiovese, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah I was like, Sangiovese, because Sangiovese oxidizes yeah. pretty well. And, and that's, you know, that's my thought process is I see orange, I see, and it's either a Sangiovese or Nebbiolo. I don't think anyone grows Nebbiolo here, do they? There's, there's, there's some people that have it. Yeah, I just haven't experienced yeah, it I haven't yet. Either. Yeah, either. But yeah, so I went with what I thought by not just like tasting the wine and be like, well, what does it taste like? I was just like, well, it looks like this and like, okay, and I know who's got what. Line yeah. up. This is probably Ron's wine because I know what the other ones <laughs> yeah. are. Yeah. yeah, it's in the same thing I mean, with Duke Mignon. I was like, well, it's Montepulciano. No. <laughs> yeah. and, and then same thing with Pedernales. Oh, it's Tempranillo. No, it's Malbec. I'm like, ah. Oh. It was a beautiful Malbec, too. It was a great I'm, Malbec, I'm yeah. not a, usually a fan of Malbec, especially no. Texas Malbecs with our propensity to have humidity here in the hill country, yeah. and they knocked it out of the park on that one. But, yeah, so this this is an excellent wine, you know, and um, it's not that – it's not that Pedernales is the only people who make Tempranillo. No. A lot of people make Tempranillo, but when you start looking at who was in the lineup, you know, it was like, you know, when Bending Branch was there, it was like, what white wine is it? Okay. <laughs> well, it's not, ten- well, it's not red, so it's not tonight. Not, yeah. right? So, yeah. and I was the only one I got right. Mm-hmm. It was, it was the first wine and it somewhat was process of elimination, but I had had the wine, mm-hmm. um, the year prior. So it was like, okay. I was like, well, what do I think it is from what it tastes like? And one of my choices because I hadn't, I didn't know what it was mm-hmm. off the top of my head. I was like, "Well, it tastes good, but I'm not really sure what it is." And then when they give us the choices, I was like, uh, "Pig pool, probably." That's what I'm going to go with. And I was yeah. so happy. I was right on that one. Yeah. Because I, that's, I've, I've probably had more Texas Pig pool blanc than any other part of the world. Yeah. And I've had it from McPherson. I've had it from Bending. And I've probably had it from a couple of places. And I've only had like a couple from France. We're making it this yeah. year over at Ron Yates for the first cool. time. We couldn't, uh, the the late free, the early freeze, I guess I should say in October really did away with a lot of the, I mean, we didn't take a single Verm, uh, Viognier or Vermentino grape this year. Mm. They just didn't happen. Uh, and we found some pick pull at the very, excuse me, we found some pick pull at the very end and we'd never worked with it. And we didn't, we, I've had it. I've had uh, John Rivenberg's, I've had Brennan, you know, but we're blown away with it this year. We, we will probably be working with it again. We really dug it. Yeah. Like Kim said, you know, Kim won, Kim won. Uh, he's like, you got to call it something else. We won, we won best in class and, and double gold at San Francisco Chronicle. And I can't sell it for anything. <laughs> oh, he won all these awards, but I can't sell it. So the, 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 uh, advice I was given was give it a fancy name. Don't yeah, call fancy. it, don't call it pick pool blanc. Give, give it a fancy name. And then just like, name. yeah, just, yeah. You, you can say what's on the back yeah. label. But yeah. 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 So when I interviewed Kim, and we get to the Peak Pool Blanc, he literally was like, because it's like, I think it was his favorite wine. Yeah, oh yeah. pretty much. Yeah. It's, it's delicious. <laughs> he, it was yeah. really good. Yeah, he, 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 you could tell he really loved that wine. Like the eyes roll back in your head. You're yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> it was, yeah. it was really good. It was, yeah. It, but yeah, so speaking of your wine, this yeah. is a really good one. I like Thank this you. one a lot. You know, I definitely enjoyed it. Uh, you know what? I should have thanked Julie, but you know I didn't get a chance to thank her. So thank her and you, and then of course yeah. my goes uh, go up to Brendan. You know, thank you so much for the five wineries supplying these wines. So this was in kind of this was an industry basically thing like uh, Psalms and and people who are in the industry yeah. and media and all that. And these wines were provided free to us. So we had five full bottles of wine, and Denise. You know, got the wines out. I, I know Denise is like going to, you guys are doing a Houston and Yeah, Dallas we're going to do right? Dallas and Houston. And so Denise is yeah. going to drive those wines. Yeah. So Julie told me about yeah. that. 
um, and you know, just getting the wines out to thus us in Austin and San Antonio. Yeah. Uh, it's an easier drive to sure. get to get sure. to the places. But you know, thank you so much for for helping us. Um, I mean, there's definitely some of us are advocates of Texas yeah, wine yeah. already. But it helps. No, it was spread great. The gospel of uh, Texas we, wine. Yeah, we we decided to do that because we normally uh, get to have our hospitality suite at Texom. Yeah, and Texom, which is a sommelier conference that brings sommeliers from all over the world, which I've. I, I am no means a sommelier. I just really like to drink wine and make it. But it's been really cool to meet all those different people there and to get to see, you know, Australians and English folks and South Africans and be like, you make wine here? Yeah. I have to try it and walk away like, wow, we, I learned something today. And it's really great uh, because you get to find new champions of what you're doing. And, and so because of the pandemic. We didn't get to have tech SOM this year. Yeah. So we decided to do a little SOM industry tasting and it turned out really well. I was very, you know, and up in, up in Texon, sometimes we can kind of get lost because there's so many other places to see and people to talk to. And a lot of the Texas sommeliers are like, ah, oh, I've had those before. I've had those before. I'm going to go. And you can't blame them. You get the chance to go taste all these other mm-hmm. wines. So it was unique for us because everybody is kind of stationary at, at this moment. And we were able to capture and get a really big audience for that. And I was really happy that we had that many Psalms sign on and enjoy it. And everybody seemed to, to really enjoy it. And the wines where I thought we poured all five were, were, all five were, were great, world yeah. class. Yeah. So th- I've, I don't think I've finished all the five yet because I corvined all mine. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> I, corvined. Uh, I corvined all of mine, <laughs> including the screw cap one. And um, yeah, it was just the just the brand with screw yep. cap, right? Yeah. Yep. And you know, I've definitely enjoyed them with with dinners or just I feel like drinking it. I've I've already I've already finished this one. Uh, and not not okay. So because I haven't finished the wine doesn't mean I didn't like it any less than anything else. But it was just kind of like. Yeah. Ah, it's appropriate for tonight. I'm going to have that one. Okay. I'm going to have this one. So, yeah. Um, and, yeah, you're right. With Texom, it's it's a great opportunity for not, for everybody to be able to be exposed to a lot of stuff. I've been a volunteer for several years now. And, you know, I get to see the behind-the-scenes stuff. Yeah. And so, yeah, we also get a lot of cool stuff, too. Yeah. Um, you know, our polishing parties and just, you know, what's left over. And so so let, let, let me explain that it's not like some drunk fest. No. That's at the pool. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> actually it, work for you guys. Yeah, it's actually work, <laughs> but um, we we will get we de- get taken very well taken care of. Um, you know, we have sponsors that come in and, and help us with our polishing parties and food and and great wines to drink and you know spit buckets. You know, yes, we may be enjoying it at the end of the night a little bit more, but you know, no one's getting completely crazy. And if now, somebody I'm, does, I'm they actually, don't come back. I'm actually <laughs> amazed at because I don't have that level of professionalism. <laughs> If there were that many wines open, I just, I don't, I wouldn't be drinking and yeah. J- James and Devin would have had to sent me to my room and said, don't come back. Yeah. I can tell you that if you're a volunteer and you get out of line, um, yeah, that'll be the, that will be the last day of that session that you are volunteering. Yeah. And you will not be invited or you not be allowed back. Now it's not an invitation. Now you yeah. have to apply. Yeah. But, um, my first year volunteering uh in when and it was the first day of volunteering it was only like 12 of us and like half of the people are like the people who run it mm-hmm. um james tidwell and i tell the story a lot and we actually had a little like pol- virtual polishing party a yeah. few weeks ago and i was one of the only people that had <laughs> glasses that were ready to be polished so i'm polishing That's while awesome. we're all talking yeah. james is on the call and i and people were throwing pictures up so i throw my picture up for my first year doing it we're at the samosa hut and um, having this uh, Pakistani, yes, like Pakistani food, which I'd never had before. And um, they're talking about That's some volunteer yeah. from the year before that got out, of, got out of line. And they're like, yeah, he's not invited back. And James kind of goes, Mark, are we scaring you? I'm like, no, I'm, I'm, no, it's, it, I'm not scared. I'm, I'm, I'm in my head. I'm like, I'm not going to be stupid. I'm not doing anything wrong. <laughs> I'm getting invited people, back. These are people I need to like know and that will help me grow, yeah. not just – you know, not just like knowledge wise, but help me grow in, in the industry. So you don't want to mess up making connections with people. No. You don't want to burn any bridges, especially, you know, this type of, this is one of those industries that's very small. Yeah. It's a big industry, but we all know each other. Everybody knows each other. So, I mean, Ron's been name dropping a lot. So these, I think every single person you've talked about, like either winemakers or vineyard owners, uh, these are, I think, I think I've met every single one. It might be one person I haven't met or I've only met like really in passing, mm-hmm. but so he's, if you don't know, he's actually talking about some really badass and like rock star people. And we, we've mentioned Bobby Cox a few mm-hmm. times, 
But these are like OGs. These are people that are the what we would consider the rock stars of our industry. It'd be the same thing as like you know saying people like you know Helen Turley and um, uh, uh, Montalena. Um, Bo. Bo, yeah. Uh, you know, and and um, uh, Heidi Barrett. I, yeah, I, I Bo remember, Barrett, I yeah, remember yeah. The, the women winemakers actually yeah. more than I remember the the male winemakers over uh, in Napa Valley. But these are like dropping, you know, doing name dropping, or like you know Beckstoffer, or or even you know. Um, Andre uh, Chelichev, you know, like some of these, these are, these are the people that, you know, built the, what we know for Napa wine. And so these are our versions yeah. of that in Texas. So like we got some good stuff here yeah. anyway. So yeah, uh, let's get Move on, on to, to the next one. Yeah. So yet another Tempranillo and I'll just pour it in that same glass. Yeah, that's fine. Because if we, I think I have one more for that last one. This right, cool. is an unreleased uh, Tempranillo. It's our first production from this vineyard. This is our 2018 uh, Dutton Vineyards Tempranillo. Rusty Dutton grows this fruit. If you don't know Rusty, he's a great guy, great character from up in New Home, which is New Home, south of Lubbock, about 45 minutes or so, just okay. due south. Incredible vineyard. Uh, we bought this fruit uh, because Todd and Reagan, our winemakers, had started connecting with Rusty, and we really, we, we, we're appreciative of how hard he was working and what he was doing. I love this, this wine because, you know, I, I talked earlier about sometimes our high plans can be fruit dominant and doesn't have a lot of that, that temper, the things that make Tempranillo Tempranillo, that herbaceousness, that, that uh, sa savory notes, the sage, the leather tobacco, mm -hmm. maybe a little tomato leaf, that kind of stuff. To me, this is the, the best of both of those things. I've got cherries, I've got blackberries, I've got fruit, but then underlying you've got sage, leather, tobacco. It's slight, you know, that's, that, that's always to me was the gauge is like how, how, how much did they work in the vineyard in Spain? Is that, $15 Rioja tastes beautiful or does it taste like tomato leaves? And like, you know, when you, it's going to have that little bit cause that's Tempranillo, but this, it's just got all for my personal preferences. It's just got all the little things in the right places. And Todd and Reagan really knocked it out of the park with this one. And, and I'm, I'm expecting, we had really good things happen, uh, uh, metal wise with the 17 and I'm, I'm expecting when this comes out to, right, to yeah. do some more stuff. So this is fantastic wine. Yes, it's Tempranillo, but it's, 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 it's a different animal, um, you know, and, and it's got a, a, a richness to it and a polish to it. Um, yeah, this is this is really mm -hmm. nice. You know, I like to say a lot of times about Rioja is Rioja tastes like Texas. And so with yeah. Tempranillo being the, the, the main, main, main grape of Rioja, there's, I think there's probably some 100% Tempranillos out there. But oh, yeah. they, they, they with Graciano, Graciano Manzuelo, uh, Masuelo, and uh, then what is else? There's, there's a couple others. Well, they, they can put some whites in like Viera mm -hmm. and some other stuff. All the, all the, all the Spanish white grapes that I could yeah. never pronounce. Yeah. <laughs> um, Viera, or not Viera. Okay. Um, but there's a there's a Texasist to Spain and I, I alluded to it I think either either yesterday's interview or or Tuesday's interview that you know maybe it's in my head because we share a heritage with Spain sure um, with Texas and Mexico and 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 Spain but you know well, I think it even goes past that I think we share we share food yeah like we share like that was one of the one of the most remarkable things as a 20 year old Texan that had been to border towns in Colorado. I've been to Oklahoma because my mom's from Oklahoma. We don't talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, beer. that's that's pretty much <laughs> that's pretty much that little you know south central part of the United States is really was my you know was, was my knowledge, and we went over to to spend a, spend like a couple of days in 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 Munich and a couple of days in in Paris before Spain and. It just, and of course, this was in the late '90s. They weren't part of the European globalization had not fully set in yet. And, yeah. But they just were, to me, and, and this is going to be a, a, a grave stereotyp um, stereotypical thing to say, but I just felt like like France and Germany were more like like uh, New York and Pennsylvania and the East Coast, big cities. That, yeah. You know, get out of my way. We got things to do. And when you got to Spain, it was just like. Ah, these people are like Texans, like good folks. You know, you drop your wallet on the street, they're going to pick it up and give it back to you. Hey, we're having dinner. Have you ate? Sit down, have dinner with us. Like have a bottle of wine, have like that. It just, it felt like good 
like good Texans, you know, yeah. with like people that help support each other. They take care of each other. If somebody is, is struggling, they're going to go help them. And not that the French and the Germans aren't like that, but in my limited time over there, I didn't get that sense from just being there. Yeah. And literally the moment I got off the train station and got in a taxi to go to where I was supposed to meet the school group, it just felt calm and, and, and people were you just didn't meet people that were that didn't want you to be there or didn't were unhappy and just that that sense of we work really hard and we have a really good time yeah and that's like what most true texans i think are we we love to we love to eat and drink we all go to work when we have to go to work but we love and and cherish those times and we take care of our own and i just really felt that in spain and it just it hit home with me and from the first time i was there that I mean, not it's not just the wine that I fell in love with. It was sitting at a dinner table on Sunday afternoon with all five of the family members of oh, the three sons from the life that all her, their kids were all back on Sundays and yeah. 20 people in a, in an apartment, everybody's having six course meals. Even the little kids are trying the Tempranillo. Mm-hmm. And I just, that really hit me. And that, and that's kind of, obviously it sent me on a path to what we're doing now. Uh, but I, I, that there's a lot of congruence between what Spain does and what Texas is starting to do and in the wine world. And it was, uh, I'm really lucky that I got to see that early on and, yeah. and that sent me on a on a on a tempranillo path i can i can say that um i haven't been to spain but um having gone to france twice in germany now once um obviously the the people that i met the hospitality was off the charts um and then my interaction with the with just the non-wine people was really good pleasant they were nice um i'm not saying that they you know they, they weren't hospitable but and you have to remember, I'm also like visiting small towns. Sure. So yeah, they don't know who I am. Yeah. They're like, who's this guy? So there's there's a little bit of like, who oh, are yeah, you? Of course. But um, you know, when I I spent time in Dusseldorf, uh, when I went to Provine last year, and um, you know, big city. Granted, I was most of my time was spent you know at a at a trade show, a you know wine trade fair. So. Like again, really hospitable. Everyone's like, "Come on in, you know, taste our wine." But when I was like at the hotel or you know, just interaction, it was like anywhere else. Nothing great, nothing bad. You know, I I got yeah. to actually at the bar, the hotel bar. You know, it was actually kind of cool. You know, some people from around, the, but they're all from around the world. Yeah, they weren't yeah. like locals. The bartender was being a bartender, being hospitable like he should be. But yeah, and then in France, uh, you know, Burgundy, I was basically in the country the entire time. So, you know, these are, you know, nice folks and all that. And I felt like a little welcoming when I was going like into restaurants and people just in general were very welcoming. Um, in Bordeaux, Bordeaux didn't have as much of that. Yeah. And um, <laughs> like, here are our wines, enjoy yeah. them or leave. And, and Bordeaux, has, <laughs> Bordeaux is kind of like, you know, the... the I, I, I love Bordeaux and I had a great time there and I love the wines there, but there was this little stiffness to things. Mm-hmm. Whereas, and, and because even, even at the wineries, great, people I'm dealing with, word. it's a great word. Yeah. It, it, even the, even with the people I was dealing with at the wineries, they, they, they were employees at the winery. So I wasn't necessarily, not every time. Sometimes I was talking to the owner. Okay. Like I, I sat down with the owner and they were, that was always awesome. But sometimes it was just like, you know, just the person who works at the winery. Whereas like here in Texas, when I have that, they're as if they are the owner because okay. they're, they're just as personable as they would. They're not just like, well, I get paid to like pay poor wine or yeah. on the PR person. Um, but in Burgundy, I was dealing with basically the, the principal at the winery and their farmers, you know, mm-hmm. they're just, they're yeah. just salt of the earth type of people. But yeah, uh, you know, when I went to Paris, yeah, Paris is a big city. Sure. You know, so you get you easily get lost. People were nice, even though I was an American. You know, we like to say that, you know. You had a different experience yeah. than I did in Paris. Well, <laughs> well the, the train conductor was, was, was a jerk. But, uh, and maybe missed my train to Bordeaux when I, when I got there. But I still got there. But, yeah, other than that, that was the only person that I, I was like, oh, and it was when I first got there. And I literally was going to buy a plane ticket and come back home. And I was like, this is BS, but I, I didn't, I, I stuck out. I, you know, I was like, I, I, know, I made, I spent all this money to come here. I have all these appointments. I don't want to let Gotta people do down. I, you know, if I was just being a tourist, I still would have gone because I want to go see everything, but he, he kind of soured me. Yeah. But yeah. Um, 
I tell you, see, you know, like, especially, you know, in Germany and France, uh, especially in the larger cities that, yeah. Um, and then even in Bordeaux, like, I, I mean, I wasn't even in this proper city of Bordeaux. I was going to all the small towns, but unless I was actually down with like somebody like you, yeah. it was kind of like, eh, you know, and they were, they're totally pleasant. Yeah. And it was great. No, I mean, not not to not to 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 speak ill of any of those other places. I just, I just, I feel like they're like. I think I think any New Yorker or North Coast North Northeasterner. I mean, my wife's from Maine. You know, we we love those Northeasterners. I, they come down, and I think they're always like, y'all are so like like first time I had my wife in the car. She was my girlfriend. Then driving out here, we passed a couple of people, and she's like, "Guy, you know everybody out here." I'm like, "What do you mean?" It's like, "Well, you've waved." It's like the last seven cars we've passed. I'm like, ah, it was just, we waved to we people. Wave we people. just yeah. waved we to wave, people. Yeah. And, and I think it's just a different mentality. And being in Spain, I felt that, that just, we don't know you, but we're happy you're here. It just, it's just a different level of comfort. I don't, I felt at home in Spain, just like I do here. Yeah. And maybe that's because I was 20 years old and in Europe for the first time and, and not a whole lot of cares in the world. But I, it, that was something that really stuck with me. Yeah. And I think that, is personified in their food and their drink and their culture. You know, they, they, they have eschewed a lot of other normal European styles. Like, you know, Hey, we'll put, we'll put, don't tempt us. We'll put something in Oak for five years, you know, fine, we'll do it. And mm-hmm. I, I, I love that about them. That is same, same thing that, that kind of got me in the wine business was people telling me you can't make good wine in Texas. And I'm like, yeah, we can. Yeah, we and then we're going to show you we can. <laughs> and I think the Spaniards have that same kind of like, don't tell us we can't do something. We may be super hard headed about it, but we'll get it done. And yeah. and I, I just, I don't know, I felt it. I've always, I went to, I had the really good fortune. I think I went five summers in a row. My, thanks, mom and dad. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and it, it, I, it certainly changed my life and put me on a totally different trajectory. And I am really proud that we make, Tempranillos that I could hand to a Spaniard and they'd be like, it tastes like something we get in Rioja. Yeah. It tastes like the Duero. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. No, I think, I think, um, you know, not just your Tempranillos, but I think, uh, as a, as a collective whole in Texas, mm-hmm. we do a really great job with, with Tempranillo. Oh. You know, one, one of the definitely a few varieties that we, I think we do a great job with. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you'd ask, you ask, you ask me what the grape of Texas is. I'm going to tell you it's it's Tempranillo. Mm-hmm. You ask oh Rivenberg, John Rivenberg, he's probably going to tell you it's Tanat. You mm-hmm. ask you ask you ask uh, Chris Brundret, he's going to tell you it's Morved. Mm-hmm. You know that's you know, but they always say Texas is bigger than France, and France has like 30 major varietals. We can't really get crammed down into one. But if you're going to put the screws on me and and ask me what it was, I would say Tempranillo. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I say it all the time. You know, we're not necessarily a monovarietal state. Mm-hmm. We can't be. We're too no, big of a state. Too, There's too it, much differentiation between just the whole country and the high plains. Right. Forget the don't. And, and then you have the other ABS yeah. in Texas. So yeah. it's yeah, you can't just say well, it's just this. But we do really well with it. Yeah, yeah outstanding. Yeah, I like that one. A Ready lot. for the last one yeah, here? Yes, it's a. Uh, this is uh, one of our flagship yeah, red wines. This is the, yeah, yeah, that's, this is a, that's, a, that's the, the Lone Ranger. Ranger. That's yeah. the last one. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite wines we do, it has a lot of, ooh, a lot of sentimentality to me. Uh, we call this the good guy. When I was a little kid, I could not pronounce the word grandpa. Supposedly it came out as good guy. That's what he said. I was the first grandchild. So it stuck. So he became the good, the good guy. guy. All right. And he was a fourth or fifth generation ranching Texan. And like everything, every stereotypical thing you think about a country ranching Texan, that was my grandpa. He was 6'5 and 250 pounds, big old boy. And, and he, uh, his, his wife, after living on the ranch for a while, wanted to be on the lake. So in the 50s or 60s, whenever they dammed up all the, or when they started selling lots on the rivers that had been dammed up, he had bought a, built a house in Kingsland on the Colorado River so my grandmother could be on the river. And they always say, I grew up too close to Austin with not having to wear socks and the long, long hair, hair from Austin. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, when we were buying the place, we could afford the two planted vineyards and the winery, but not the two cleared pieces of adjoining land. 
Good guy was, so, there's his picture on the back, if you can see that. Good guy was so excited that his long-haired hippie grandson was getting out of the music business and into agriculture. Yes. So he bought the two pieces of adjoining land, the East Field that we were out in the back over there. We shot the first drone. He bought that and gave us a 99-year lease for a dollar. So here's to the good oh, guy. Yeah, here's the good guy. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So this is 42% uh, Tempranillo, okay. 17% Graciano. 17% Cab Sauv, 17% Merlot, and 7% Syrah. All right. I think my math is right on that. I went to law school, not math school, so don't hold me to it. <laughs> my sister has her master's in accounting. We went in divergent ways. Mm. But I love this wine. We made it in 2011. Uh, we had our first crop off that vineyard. It was three grapes at the time. It was the Cab, the Tempranillo, and the Merlot. I mean, the Cab, Tempranillo, and the Graciano. We just decided to field blend everything. It was two barrels worth. And we said, hey, we'll make this this year. Starting the next year, this fruit will go to all the things it's supposed to go to. We were in between winemakers. So my cousin and I kind of hid the barrel in the corner. And Todd found it. I was like, what's this? And I'm like, well, it's this thing we did. And he was like, this is really good. I'm going to change the blend next year. I'm going to add Merlot to it and Syrah. But we're going to keep making it. So we've made this every year since 2011. All right. And I dig it. Another another rock star, you know, knock it out of the park wine here. And this is the 17, which uh, we have not released yet. This will come out sometime in the spring. Okay. And uh, mostly for selfish reasons, I just wanted to taste it with you. You know, we I, we could have tasted the 16, what we're selling right now, but you know, and and I, I tell people all the time, I leave a very charmed life. You know, whether it's coming out to Texas wineries or going to Napa, you know, what everywhere I've gone. You know, I get access, but people pull cool stuff. It's not every single time. I mean, it's like cool stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, they always pull cool stuff, yeah, like yeah. it's good, like, but it's current release and all that. But I mean, I get a lot of times something that's just like a special thing that the person says, "Hey, I just want to drink it. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna drink this tonight. All right, cool. <laughs> you know, and, and things like that. Or they, they bring out like Bobby Cox brings out something from the '80s or. Yeah. I go somewhere and they're pulling out, you know, aged Riesling for me in Germany. It's like, you know, at, at the winery. It's a good life. It's a, it's a really good life. good life. It's a really good life. Yeah. yeah. Thank y'all for helping us yeah. live this life. But no, this, this wine, um, I got lots of really nice dark fruit with this. The, yeah, we were talk, talking about complexities earlier. It's mm -hmm. so crazy what all like the Merlot. We were talking on the in the in the, in the cart earlier. Like I can I can I know what these all taste like before they get blended, so I have a little bit of a strategic advantage. Right. But I can taste the clay from the Merlot mm -hmm. in this. Yeah. I can taste that little bit of little bit of herbaceous and and kind of black currant from the cab, and I get all of the deliciousness of Tempranillo and Graciano. And the Syrah gives it that just little kind of wild untamed bit there at the finish and for me you know there's this there's this velvety and silkiness and elegance that i'm going to attribute to the merlot mm -hmm. i mean and the cab is giving you some some like, yeah. power and all that yeah. but having these grapes they all play well together yeah that graciano is given just I, I can't wait till the day that we produce enough graciano i can bottle it on its own yeah but because every year we have it separate and we're like uh, this would really be great on its own. We're getting there. But it, it, each of these grapes really just adds a unique thing to this blend. And it's really fun to see, you know, because you know, normally our blends are one, you know, two grapes, maybe a little bit of the third, but five grapes. It's, it's you know, yeah. obviously 42% of it's Tempranillo. So it's going to be dominant. And you add that 17% Graciano, that's going to be the Spanish stuff, but just the ability. And maybe I'm just happy that over time I've actually learned how to taste wine, but like those little things like, mm, I pick up this and I know that's from that grape and I pick up this and I know that's from that grape. It's it, that kind of makes you feel accomplished as a wine taster. Yeah. And, and that's where, you know, when, when, so people go, why do you blend wine? Well, there's, there's lots of reasons, but one of the things is that each of these grapes is going to bring something special to the table. Even if it's only like a couple of percent, three, four or 5%, you know, think of it as like seasoning, extra seasoning, you just, just a dash of salt or a dash of whatever, that's a great analogy. you know, yeah. um, these are, these are what you, the wine would be totally fine without that. You know, um, even if you, even if like something high percent is like a 17% of something, it, it'll be probably a good wine without sure. it. But that 17% or that 5% or that 10% adds, adds something to it and makes it, gives it an extra bit of complexity. And that's why you do it. It's just like when you're making food, 
you know, it, yeah, the food tastes fine, but mm -hmm. uh, you know what? Throw a little oregano in there, right? Yeah. Sure. All right. It adds that to that. Throw a little that salt, little kick, or sugar, yeah. or whatever it is. Yeah. Mm. I haven't had this one in a, in a few months. Dig it. I'm going to have to revisit that one. <laughs> you know, it, it's. It's kind of hard to sit there and be like, well, what's your favorite of the flight, Mark? Yeah. I think all of them are good. Um, I think I think our beginning and ending wines were great beginnings and endings. Um, you know, and everything in the middle, you know, was was excellent. You know, uh, I, I would say, and I tend to drink more red wine than white wine, but I really like good white wine. And, you know, this wine was, I super enjoyed this wine when, when, when I drank it. You know, and then the next Tempranillo, and then... Um, you know the good guy and, and your your no name label and you know these are all wonderful wines and and then the uh, Carignan and the Carignan and Morved Morved mm -hmm. yeah I mean they all are they're all checking boxes for me you know depending on what I'm looking for out of a wine but yeah I think the bookends were probably my favorites and you know I tell people all the time I'm probably more of an old world type of thing but man I appreciate new world stuff just as well as old world it's not it doesn't have to be you know it yeah. doesn't have to taste like dirt for me to like it you know it, it yeah. can taste like fruit it can yeah. taste like it can taste like you know you know blackberry cobbler it, it can taste it, like that. <laughs> that but that's crazy you know that was one thing like as as a as a you know i got into this business because i loved wine mm -hmm. and i wanted to make world-class wines and i wanted there was some there was some semblance of you know the prove them prove everybody else wrong because i'm a texan and i want to show you can do it but I, 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 when I first got into this, I, I, Tempranillo was, you know, what I, what I fell in love with in, in Spain and, and Tempranillo can be so versatile. It can be elegant and soft and beautiful, like Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. It can be Duero over the top, oaked and, and heavy. And that's where I really found like the nuances of each wine and each grape is it's just, it blows my, it still to this day blows my mind how you can, you know, have the same grape at the same location and farm it different ways and it will make crazy different wines. Yeah. Or, you know, or farm it the same way and ferment it and age it different ways and yeah. it creates the same wine. And there's just little niches, uh, niches, niches, however you say that. Either way, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's <laughs> of, of, of flavor profiles and you can have a group of 10 people and taste 10 wines and everybody could, and they could all be world-class made, like no flaws, like made best, best they could be made. And everybody's going to like something different. Yeah. And at that, to me, finding out, like watching people taste and see it and see, well, I like this and this, and then kind of leading them this way. I'm like, Oh, you should try that one. Then that's always been so much fun to me to, to get to see the little minutia in these wines that makes people like this wine or that wine better. And it's, that's always been, like a perplexing fun thing for me to what is it that makes that person like that one or right. makes that person like, and I'll, you'll never know, you know, you could research for years and it's just, that's, there is, there is objectivity and subjectivity in wine. And I think the interplay between those two is it's fascinating to me and how yeah. people react and, and, and accept those different flavors and what they're looking for. And, 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 uh, that, and it's just, it's continually evolving for me. There's always something new to taste. There's always some flavor that I haven't had. There's always some wine that I haven't had. And, you know, uh, that it's just, it's the more I get into this business every day, the more fun I'm having and the more enthralled I am with what we're doing. You know, and, and talking about the you know, from, from based on two major areas of Spain that do it, you know, there's, there's an overarching, like, um, really difference in style of those two wines, you know, um, the Duero is, if you don't, if you don't read better, the Duero, um, they tend to have that I'm almost more of a new world international style mm -hmm. to their Tempranillo. Mm -hmm. So they have that lusciousness and the, the bigness of fruit and maybe confused with say Cabernet Sauvignon sure. type of stuff. And then Rioja has that, like it's, it's dusty and it's dirty, mm -hmm. dirty in a good way, you know, dusty, <laughs> dirty, leathery. You well, know, it, tastes, it tastes like the dirt. It tastes yeah. like the mountain. And, and I, yeah. I like that interplay of the, of the dusty. I mean, I think, I think that's well said. I, I, and we tend to sometimes here in Texas, like, 
the hill country tends to be a little more like Rioja because it's yeah. hotter. You get more of that herbs and that and that that savory notes. And then the high plains, you can get more of that the high tone fruit notes because you're getting cooler nights. And, and you know, obviously the manipulation and the winemaking makes makes a, a difference. But the way we make it, we always kind of say our estate wines are more like. Uh, more like the Duero and I mean, more like Rioja yeah. and our high plains are more like the Duero. And it, it's been fun explaining those differences to everybody. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's amazing. Just in that one country, they have the same type of thing where you can really have two kind of contrasting styles. Um, and but, that's not even considering yeah. Higandas or Priorat and all the other places. <laughs> yeah. And, and then my personal thing with, with, with drinking wine, you know, I'm, you know, I'm very like you. I, I want to try it all. I want to drink it all. I want to try it all. And, you know, I I haven't – well, I have my favorites as far as parts of the world. Um, I I don't think I've settled on anything mm-hmm. and be like I'm strictly this. And I've, I've had people – I've had people say, well, if you had to choose, what are you going to choose? And I, I – so I, I start really big. Old world. Okay, well, come on, Mark. That's, yeah. that's a lot. <laughs> what country? Uh, France or Italy? Right, pick a, pick a pick a country. Yeah. Italy, and and I'm even like I'm kind of like but I really like French wine. Yeah. Certain French wines. I mean, yeah. I like all French wine, but but, but certain things I'm like, oh, I really like that one. And then you know we'll, we'll nail it down, and I'm kind of like, okay, Italy. Well, what about? And then I'm like, it, it's kind of hard for me to choose. Right, so on that. good for you. I couldn't even. I mean, I guess. I guess if somebody put put me thumb on me, I'd say Spain because I'm familiar yeah. with that. But how, where do you go within Spain? Where do you go with it? I mean, what Italy was at 2,700 great yes. great varietals. <laughs> I mean, where do you go in France? And like that's the cool thing about the wine world. Yeah. It, there's it's a never ending journey, and it should be a journey that takes you from early on when you're a young uh, uh, early wine drinker and what you like at that point and as you grow and your taste buds change and you learn and you 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 learn not only light wine lessons but you learn life lessons and things happen and it's that little journey i mean i started drinking my mother made my she'll be mad at me for saying this my mother made my father uh quit scotch in 1996 or 97 he it was you know was a lawyer that came home and had a scotch or two every night and maybe it became three and finally mom was like it's time to quit drinking scotch and so i went to ut and came back that like maybe a month later and the downstairs bathroom had been turned into a wine cellar all right i was like hmm, i can dig this uh, and so we had a lot of nights and my, uh, drinking my dad, when he, when he went to John, met John at the Austin wine merchant and John Rennick and was like, I want some wine. And John sold him all the great cabs. Yeah. So I remember we were sitting in my buddy, Reagan, who's our assistant winemaker. Now we would, uh, sit down with my dad and play dominoes and drink all these crazy Napa cabs and, and, uh, Burgundy cab, I mean, uh, Bordeaux cabs Bordeaux, yeah. and, and like, I was like, oh, I love all this. And then when I finally, that I used to like, you know, like every other American at that time, cab, that's it. Like, why would you drink anything else? And then it finally, finally got to where I got to Spain. It was like, Tempranillo is so much better than cab. And it's a personal opinion, but that, that journey of like winding and oh, I'm drinking this right now, or I'm drinking this. And it just, if, if you're truly a wine fan and you really want to explore, it's a lifetime of exploration. I mean, I got some, uh, so Paul Hobbs wines from uh, from uh, the other day from Yakubian Hobbs from Georgia. Like we're drinking Armenia. The, Ar- Armenia that's right. Uh, well, I next, to, yeah, next. To, and and <laughs> you're like these are like four thousand year old vines, and and the wines are good. They're okay, okay yeah. but I mean they're they're very drinkable and they're nice. But you're like I'm just I'm drinking like world history right here, you know. And and, and that's that kind of stuff that really geeks me out. I like, try and. I mean, and and, that, and the lesson early on that I learned when when drinking all that cab and everybody drink cab and going to Spain and be like, oh, this personally Tempranillo has so much more flavors going on than cab. Cab to me tastes like the same three flavors always. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It can be gorgeous, it can be really well done, but Tempranillo can taste like so many different ways. It you can be it can be you know like we talked about it can be light and soft and Pinot esque or it can be almost cab esque depending mm-hmm. on where it is and. And that's what started me on the journey. And I mean, I, we, my wife is still mad at me for all the wine that I buy. And, and she's like, we've never had that before. I'm like, I know. Exactly. I want to see I what it tastes like. Yeah. yeah. You know, so the Jacobian Hobbs, I have the Arene 
black label and white label. Yep. I reviewed the black label, and guess who emailed me? Paul emailed you? Nope. Yakovian. Oh, really? One of the Yakovian brothers emailed me, and uh, he was like, thank you for your honest review. And I gave, I gave a good oh. review, but he was oh. like, he saw an evolution because I didn't know what to think of this wine. Mm-hmm. And then at the end of it, I was – I accepted what it was, no. and I liked it a lot. And I'm excited to try the white label because the white label apparently is the higher yeah. end one. And I'm going to try to. So, if you're watching this, uh, I saw him emailed you. So I'm going to try to get a Skype interview. So I'm going to try to do a Skype interview with him um, soon. We just get just get with Susan. Susan and Paul are good buddies. Susan Aller. <laughs> yeah. When, when when they were hiring uh, uh, Sergio, I guess Sergio. Worked, yeah. Sergio works Sergio's for Paul badass. Hobbs, South America. Sergio, one yeah. of the better winemakers in the state, if not, you know, up there with all of them. I should, yeah. I'm not allowed to, to play favorites, but <laughs> Sergio makes kick-ass wines. He does. Uh, we were kind of between, both of us were between winemakers at the time, and we had thought for a, uh, there was a small period where maybe we were going to hire, because they were not, they didn't make, at the time, Fall Creek, their whole production was not their fine wines, and they didn't know which way they were going to go, and, you know, we were like, oh, we, we don't, we didn't, at Spicewood at the time, we just didn't make a lot of wine. I was like, maybe it'd be good for us to to hire one winemaker and then very quickly susan decided that that probably wasn't going to work and then found out later that because she knew paul hobbs very well and paul had had uh had said you should probably talk to sergio and then after she told me that i was like i've been on paul hobbs waiting list for like four years to get in that damn wine club <laughs> you didn't tell me you had him on speed dial susan <laughs> yeah come on susan <laughs> so i i've talked to a they're, they're the New Jersey guy came out. They talked. So I, I, t- I talked to a few people about this, and I think wouldn't it be cool if I had both uh, the the I can't re- I can't remember which which Jacobian is, but no. um, if I had Jacobian and the Hob and, yeah. and Paul Hobbs on the same Skype call, if, if but it would mean it was probably in Armenia, probably during harvest. Yeah, probably wouldn't <laughs> have any time, but that would be really cool yeah, to do fun. that. But um, yeah, uh, it's just funny because at a random thing, he pulls out like out he pulls out like pretty obscure wine. To be yeah, really it's, honest. I mean, it may be the most obscure. <laughs> in the, I mean, there's probably other things, but it's but, it's pretty obscure. And that I've had <laughs> and I've reviewed. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think I did the review back in May, April. Somewhere around it was it was earlier this year. I've got a couple more of those. I'll I'll make sure next time I crack one open, I'll do it with you. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, so for me, I'm very much like that. I will, if I see something interesting, I will, I will tend to buy it. And um, uh, I, I've never used this analogy before, but I'm going to start using it now. It's like having the killer re- record collection, right? Like actual records. And the person has just genres, all types of genres. So like that's what I like to do with one. I like to have a little bit of everything oh. because I like a little bit of everything. When it comes to music, there's a few styles of music i'm not a fan of but i can tell you whether or not it's a good yeah, song you can still dig it well you can still well dig made it. And all yeah, that. Yeah. but yeah it, it's yeah I, I equate music and wine a lot of times mm-hmm. anyway mm-hmm. but yeah that's it's i like to try it all i have a wide variety of stuff at home if it's something i've never seen before never had before and it's not terribly crazy expensive and that might change from week to week depending <laughs> on how much money is my depending account what is yeah, yeah. but what does you know, that I'll mean buy it. terribly expensive yeah I tell people all the time, I don't want anything like expensive, but what's that to you? Because I had somebody once tell me they didn't want anything crazy, make sure it was under three hundred dollars. I was like, oh, okay, uh, you just basically have everything except for like a thirty or forty wines in my list. Yeah. I, I I can sell you. We're good. <laughs> I, I've got some things for you. Exactly, exactly. Well, Ron, I think we're at a good stopping point right, here. Man. Yeah. Um, and unless there's anything that we no, want I to. Just- chat about when well, you want anything else you want to talk about i'd just like to yeah i think we've i think we've thanked this guy for for being a good steward for the texas wine industry and and we have you know there's a lot of sommeliers out there that are that are in writers and and bloggers and pr folks that are really helping us get along and and we've we've had to fight a little bit of a of a misperception uh from our early days a long time ago that we couldn't make great wine in texas and so thank you for for you and yeah, the other you. folks like you that are helping to get the word out and, and doing all these wonderful things to show everybody that we do make kick-ass wine in the state yeah and i can count a lot of those people's friends too i mean i've i've it's been really great over the years to meet a lot of these people that are in my side of things uh, and a lot of them focus solely on Texas. Mm-hmm. And I, I love that they do that. Um, 
and I get to just kind of play around occasionally. I like, hey, let's, you know, it's in my backyard. Literally, I mean, you know, some of these people like live in like Houston and they make the drive yeah. out here. I have like an hour and a half ish, two ish, not two, well, not quite two hours to get here, but an hour and a half ish, two hour drive to get the whole country. And they're driving like four and five hours to come over here. So, you know, kudos to them, Jeff Cope. <laughs> I'm talking about you, dude. Who's Congratulations, awesome. Jeff. Uh, yeah. And to- Michelle for their blogs. They just yes. made the list of the top. Yeah, top. The, uh, they're like number fourteen. Jeff's fourteen. Way to go, yeah. Jeff. Go fourteen. Something like that. Yeah, Jeff, you're a badass. So, um, and I've known him. He, I think I met him my first text on. I think I met him my first text. Want to hear a fun Jeff Cup story? Yeah. Oh, I probably shouldn't tell this one. He might get mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> first time I'm at, uh, no, I can't tell this one. Right, don't tell I'll, it. Tell it off. I'll tell you it off. Tell me off I'll camera. tell off camera. Yeah. Off camera. All right. Yeah. Don't worry, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, thank you. I mean, thank you for, for that appreciation. Yeah. And thank you for everything you're doing here uh, along with the other rest of the Texas fine wine group. Um, and, uh, yeah, we're going to wrap things up. Uh, you're going to see some more cool stuff. I got another Texas interview to do. Um, I have all kinds of great things in my head that I haven't finalized yet. Hopefully by the time you're seeing this, those, those little finals, those things have been kind of nailed down how the new version of everything is going to be. Uh, I've got the three camera set up though. I know that camera, you know, here light went out. Sorry, but it looks actually pretty good. Yeah. It looks actually all right, but yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's a long way to say we had a great time doing all this and uh, we'll see everyone next time. Thank you. Cheers.